All right, good afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you to the, for the organizers. It's been such a wonderful meeting. I've been following this meeting online for a few years. It's a tremendous honor to, to be here. I'm going to be presenting some work uh, that we're doing at the Machine Perception Laboratory with Elon Barinholtz and Michael Teddy and Stephanie Lukowitz, who are, are here today. Um, so I'm going to talk about sparse coding, how we can learn dictionaries using a sparse coding technique, and then something I'm really excited about, uh, how we can combine this with compressed sensing. So I found this with Rosenbach, uh, Rosenblatt quote from uh, 62, and he says, you know, the perceptron program, he's really interested in natural intelligence, you know, the physical conditions that allow the emergence of psychological properties. And I think it's been really exciting to, this meeting to hear that everybody is really still focused on the brain. Uh, in 1925, I found this, uh, this walking beetle, mechanical walking beetle. So I'd be very happy if in our group we could get something that has the sophistication and complexity of a beetle. This is what we work with. It's a small scale car, it's got a little camera, microphone, uh, wireless connection, and then we run different uh, neuro-inspired algorithms to see if we can get this thing to control itself. But what I wanna talk about today is how can we get this little agent or a uh, brain to represent the visual information using as few resources as possible. So we know it's been talked about a lot this week, uh, just sort of this has been mapped out a long time and we've figured out what do these actual cells do and they sort of have receptive fields that look like this. Um, so we can sort of get the data and we can uh, approximate these as Gabor functions, but how can we learn these? So in the deep learning framework, we can think of this as sort of the first layer. This is the edge detection. Uh, we know that we can understand edges because we can understand sketches. And so if an artist sort of sketches out a scene, we can instantly know what that is even though it's only edges. So how can we build that with a sparse coding model? So the idea is that you're gonna have an image and you're gonna wanna break this up into some collection of known features and then you might have some extra, some noise that you can do some denoising. You know, I like to imagine you know, something like Netflix, right? They have to ship so many bits for video, and so every little video patch that you wanna see, they've gotta update, you know, send you all of those pixels. So one way you could imagine doing this, if they ship you this code book, you know, and you store this on your set-top box, then they don't have to actually tell you all of the pixels in the image, they just tell you which of those you're gonna superimpose to get back your image. And so this is, the brain almost has to be doing something like this. It would just be too inefficient to transmit all that information. If we can get to a sparse representation, where now we only have 64 numbers as opposed to 256. And furthermore, these numbers tell us something about the image. They sort of have semantic information. There's an edge at this orientation in this location. So uh, very inspired by uh, Dr. Kenyon's work. Um, and he says, you know, this captures a, a good chunk of the computer vision and theoretical neuroscience being done in the last decade you know, in this equation here. So what do you do when you want to solve that? Well, you go and you get yourself a differential analyzer. Right? They've made a lot of progress over the years in this kind of thing. But the exciting part is you can really implement this in hardware. Right? You can really build this into a circuit, into analog. And so you get this uh, you know, set of differential equations that you can solve, and this thing will settle to a solution. Uh, so this is what we heard about this morning. It's very exciting about the new chip that we can try to run this on. And so what you want to pay attention to is this inhibition term, because later, right, uh, Garrett might throw some uh, tomatoes at me, but we're going to try to remove that and, uh, and see what that looks like. So in this, we see there's a threshold function uh, that's going to sort of act to sparsify things. And we can see this is the soft threshold, looks something like this. Uh, so we can see there the threshold. And I was actually watching a talk, and I came across this, and it said they were sort of measuring what neurons actually do, and they found this third order power law. And we had been doing some modeling with cubic equations from some other neuro stuff, and we thought this would be a natural fit. So we said, well, you know, why have this soft threshold? Why not just throw in this cubic function? You know, it might have some nice properties being continuous and all. So what's exciting is once you have your sparse code, you can have a very simple sort of Hebbian rule. You can imagine that inner term in the parentheses as being your, your residual. That X is some, some sort of stimulus. W is this dictionary. Z is your code that's gonna tell you which of your dictionary elements are going into this reconstruction, and then you can measure that difference, and so that'll be your residual. And so if you have that residual and you just multiply it by the code itself, you can get this update which will, which will train your weights for you. So it's very simple, you can sort of build this. And then we've tried to simplify it a little bit more, um, and we found that you can learn a dictionary very quick in sort of a half a second or so if you normalize your weights and then you sort of get the inner product between your uh, sort of a batch of images that you'll turn into column vectors. And then if you sort of measure the inner product and then normalize that and then cube it, you can then throw that into the weight update equation and this will update your weights. And it, and it goes very, very, very fast. So you can learn a dictionary. I think this one took like a half a second or so. 
What's really exciting is you can then run this on color images. And it's known in, uh, from the biological data that in, um, we see when you, when you look at animals, you see that there's always this red, green, and blue, yellow alternation. And uh, we, we find that's very interesting that this also emerged out of this coding. And you don't really get the other pairs. You don't see a red, yellow, and such. So we can run this on different image classes. Uh, this was originally motivated by you know, birds have to know what they should eat. Uh, certain butterflies you can eat, certain butterflies you can't eat. How is it the little bird brain would sort of figure this kind of thing out? And so if you uh, expose these learning systems to only one class of these images, you get very different sort of receptive fields that emerge out of these. Um, you know, this one over here in the lower right, this is called a zebra butterfly. And you can see these sort of zebra stripes just fall out of it. And what's also interesting is some of the uh, orientation selection and the color selection features, they show up in different neurons. And so that's kind of interesting that they sort of spread out in that sense. And so there's the zebra butterfly again. And the different classes of butterfly, you get these very different receptive fields. Then what we can do is we can sort of arrange these things in an array, and then almost like cookie cutter block these things. So you can see over there the sort of the block size. And then what we do is we do a winner take all on the, at the block level. And so we find out which block has the most activation for a particular batch. And then we zero out everything else. And then we do the update for the dictionary. And so only that one block will get updated on that round. And what's really exciting is it sort of organizes all of these features. And they show up in sort of uh, an unsupervised kind of clustering of these features. And then we can, if you smoothly vary this block, you know, where it's not just cookie cutter, but change the stride around, you can get this sort of smooth mapping, which is similar to what we see in the cortex of this sort of orientation selection pinwheels. And so this is exciting. This sort of falls out of such a simple mechanism of, of sparsity at, the, at this block level. And then we can do this with color images. And I think it's really exciting that we sort of get these color features show up. You know, they're always talking about the redness of red and how is it that we can have something like that. Well, maybe at the next layer up, we have a, a neuron that's responding to that whole thing, this sort of just red stuff. And so I think it's really interesting how these things kind of cluster together. You get sort of like bird type features and then minivan type. This is on CIFAR 10. And you get sort of horse-like features show up, and then these smooth variations. So this is all completely unsupervised. And then we get some sort of interesting effects that you can't turn on this block sparsity right away. Right? You have to let the loop sort of run 10, 20, 30 times or so, and then you turn on the block sparsity. If you turn it on too soon, you get these sort of areas that don't get developed. So I think there's sort of some very interesting sort of developmental neuroscience with this kind of thing of when do you activate these different types of features when you get very different effects. Uh, you can do this with volumetric data or um, hyperspectral data. So this is some MRI data that we've been trying to code. Now I'd like to switch gears a little bit. Um, this is a punch photograph. So this was actually the Herman Hollerus inspiration for the, the punch card computing system. And what it was is when you would get on the train, these, these pictures up here, these caricatures, the conductor would actually take a hole punch, they would look you over, and they would assign a category to you. If you had chops or a hat or whatever it was, that would be the label. So they're, in one go, they're not taking an image of you, they're assigning a category directly. So they're sort of doing this compressed classification and, and assigning a class to you straight up. So pictures, photographs have changed quite a bit. We have cameras like this. It's not unreasonable to have tens of millions of pixels in a single image. Well, are there 10 million ideas in an image? Certainly not. And so what is the first thing your camera does when you take a picture? Well, it's going to compress that data. It's going to throw away 97% you know, of the information it just collected. Why go through the trouble of collecting all that data? And so the idea with compressed sensing is sort of flip this around. If you're just going to throw this all away, why did you bother to record all that? So that you can directly sense and compress, and then recover if you need to. But often in, in real life, we don't actually have to do a sort of recovery of the signal. We need to make a decision. We have to choose a behavior. We need to have our little car go around the track. And so we wanted to think about how we can do that directly. And so this is compressive sensing. You know, Shannon Nyquist's theorem says you find the highest frequency signal, and you'll double that, and then you'll be sure not to miss anything. Well, this is sort of a worst case scenario. Real signals that we might encounter in the lab or in the natural world aren't really this bad. And a lot of signals, especially what we encounter in neuroscience, they're sparse, that most of the signal will be zero, or it's sparse in some domain. And so this uh, leverages some new uncertainty principles, and uh, randomness plays a really key role. So imagine if we have a sparse vector there, x, 
Most of that vector is zeros, but we don't know where the non-zeros are. We have no idea. They could be anywhere. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sort of randomly project this thing, take a random matrix, and then we'll randomly undersample this thing, and we'll get another of, a number of measurements m, which is going to be much less than m, uh, much less than the number of pixels in x, I'm sorry. So you're going to be able to this massive sort of dimension, uh, reduction in dimensionality. And the idea is, can you go backwards? And if you go, you know, ask a mathematician and you say this is an arbitrary signal, well, no, you, surely you can't. You're going to lose information. But the idea is that this signal is sparse, and so we can get away with this. And so if we look at what this is, it's actually the same thing as uh, sparse coding, so really the same equation. So in compressed sensing, we have some data that we captured, and we want to go back. Uh, we have this code, and we want to go back to the data. We want to recover it from our compressed measurements. And sparse coding, we have some data, and we want to sort of build a code out of it, build a sparse code. So they're really sort of inverses of each other. Um, that's really the same equation. And so I think this is exciting because if we have some sort of neural hardware that might be able to do this in our brain or in uh, you know, an analog chip, then we can solve both these problems at the same time. It's the same machinery. It doesn't really know which of the two problems you're giving it. So in one case, you'll be using a random matrix and going from a signal to the measurements. And in others, you're going from an image using a dictionary and trying to get out a code. And then we can uh, see how we can use these two together. So to motivate this a little bit, uh, there's sort of these micro mirror arrays. It's most likely what's driving this projection system. And so these are these little mirrors. They're about the size of a blood cell. And you can program these things with a, with a bit string, and they'll sort of flip in one of two directions. Now what you can do with this is they've built a, what's called a single pixel camera. And so since you can sort of steer these uh, little mirrors, you can collect light selectively from you know, pixels uh, from, uh, from a scene. And so what you're able to do with this framework is they send in a random number generator. It's going to create a random mask of these pixels. So essentially half the light from your object is going off to nowhere. The other half of the light will get collected all to a single photoresistor, a single pixel. And this is all going to get sort of mashed together. And so you get sort of one analog number coming out of that photoresistor. You'll record that number. You'll create a new mask. You'll repeat this many times, but not nearly as many times as you have samples in the pixels. So you can get away with much fewer measurements than if you were to sort of naively sample this image. And you can see over here, they've able to get you know, 50 times reduction in the number of samples. And you can still read what that is. And so that's this single pixel camera. And I think this is exciting as sort of a metaphor for how you know, that we might have a sort of a large array of neurons that sort of randomly get mapped to another population of neurons. Uh, it's very, you know, it's exciting from a sort of DNA evolution point of view. It's easy to get a bunch of random connections, or at least it might be. And so if you take your image and you sort of take the inner product with a bunch of these random masks and you record all of those signals, you can recover that image. And so it has to do with the, these measurements are sort of, the, in some sense, maximally opposite of what your basis that you're going to try to represent your image in. And so that maximal difference sort of allows this thing to work. So there's like an actual example. I sort of ran this one in MATLAB. You can see there's just a, a sparse vector there on the right. You can see only a few places, places are actually turned on, but we don't know where they are. And so we sort of have a thousand vector. We want to sort of map this thing down. And so each uh, row of that matrix then is going to be a mask. And we can just do a matrix vector multiply. And so this is also exciting if we have uh, very high speed uh, vector matrix multiply, then we can sort of implement this uh, readily. And so now we have over here our compressed measurements. And the idea is, how do we go backwards? And the exciting thing is we can use LCA, which they would, uh, spoke about in the first talk this morning. So here is, you can imagine this is sort of an imaginary spike train. And then we're going to sort of randomly undersample that. And so up top, we see just sort of this random simple spike train. We don't know where those non-zeros are. Uh, we're going to randomly undersample it. So this had a, 100 entries. We're going to smash it down to 10. So throw away 90% of the samples. And then here's the reconstruction error. You know, it's a perfect, a perfect recovery. Um, I was talking to someone about this recently. And they're like, well, you, know, you can cut corners. And you might get lucky. About no, this isn't about getting lucky. I mean, there's, with extremely high probability, you're, if this signal is sparse, you're, you're going to be able to get perfect recovery. So here it is with, with another example. And then what's neat is because this is just sort of matrix operations, you can kind of readily multiplex this. Um, and it can, do, it can compress and recover more than one signal at a time. And so here we see three signals, uh, again, with perfect recovery. And then you can do like 100 signals at once. And so you can imagine having like sort of lots of different arrays of neurons and sort of all mapping to another area. And you can sort of recover them all at once. And here we see this is perfect re reconstruction error. Uh, this here is the L2 recovery to show that sort of a, um, 
a pseudo inverse technique will not work. You sort of lost way too much information. But by having this uh, dynamical system, the LCA, that we're able to recover that perfectly. So here's just a few more examples of the, 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 the one dimensional case. Uh, here's the mask. You can imagine this is the sort of representation of the full signal. This one's 1,000. We drop it down to 100, and then we're able to perfectly recover that signal. Uh, and again, so you can do this with you know, 100 signals at a time because your input is now not a, a vector, but it's a, but it's a matrix. And so if you just do a matrix matrix operation of your mask with all of these signals you need to compress, you can uh, compress and recover them in, in a single go. So that, the signal we were looking at happened to be canonically sparse. It was sparse on its own, but most signals aren't, they're sparse in some basis. They're not sparse on their own. Uh, in images, it might be frame differences, or with audio, it might be in a Fourier domain. Or in images, we can look at DCT. Um, and so this is sort of the basis behind JPEG and all. And so we know that we can take a patch out of a scene and, and break it down into a Fourier dictionary and then you know, basically recover it with very little loss. And so we can do that if we sort of take this, we take our random matrix, and then here we could use a DCT matrix. And now we can compress a signal that might not, and recover signal, might not be actually sparse uh, canonically, but it's sparse in some domain. And so here we could take sort of a natural scene, a little chunk of a forest kind of thing. Um, and then if we sort of throw away half the pixels with this random uh, single pixel camera scenario, we can recover you know, a decent version of that, whereas the pseudo inverse, the L2, sort of gives us nothing, just, just a bunch of gibberish. And then we you know, do the same thing. We throw away lots of these pixels. And then what we found was really interesting, sort of uh, very surprising, is what we were trying to do is, OK, well, instead of DCT, let's load in one of these learned dictionaries, because we went all this trouble of learning all of these cool dictionaries. Let's throw that in instead of DCT. And then we found something very, very interesting. And so this is sort of a, uh, just something we found recently. It actually fixes L2. So when we add in this custom dictionary and we do try to do this recovery, so up top we have a DCT uh, scenario where it's this equation where this matrix here is going to be discrete, discrete cosine transform. And you can see in that version the L2 does not work at all. If we do the pseudo inverse, we cannot recover the image. But when we add in our sparse dictionary, um, disappointingly, our LCA did not recover it. But amazingly, L2 did. So this, sort of, this is a very surprising result. Uh, it, it could be that just we see the need to play around with the parameter space here to sort of get this to converge. Uh, but I thought this was very interesting that, you know, that now we have sort of a, a closed form solution for that, for that uh, recovery. So von Neumann wondered how imperfect uh, biological neurons you know, con containing many random connections, how is it these things can you know, perform the tasks of idealized neurons? And uh, you know, end with, the, you know, we don't always have to do reconstruction, right? Really, sometimes we want to do inference directly. And then we have this sort of cascade of, of, of uh, demands that you know, re reconstruction is at the top, but sometimes we, don't, we just want to estimate something or classify it or even just detect that it's there. You know, if a tiger is jumping out at you, you don't really need to know that it's a tiger. You need to know you need to run. And so it's really the action choice that would be much, much, you can get to that directly. And so we're very excited about you know, pushing this forward and can we you know, make choices directly on compressed measurements because we think this might be a theory of how our brain works. And so you can, uh, you know, the random projections are essentially sufficient statistics. And then we might be able to learn and do inferences directly on these compressive measurements. So uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Any questions? So I have one. Um, so um, Ginguli and Sampolinsky had a paper, I don't know, five years ago, talking about how compressed sensing specifically maps into different brain regions. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, right, right. So, I mean, are you, are, from a neuroscience application, are you thinking this is something like visual cortex only, or is it like a general thing? What are your views on that? I, I think it's got to be showing up everywhere. You know, when you really think about it, I mean, how, it would almost be nature would have to be trying not to use a scheme like this. Um, that it seems like if it was possible for evolution to find this, it probably might be showing up in, in lots of different areas. Okay, very nice. Thank you. Um, so when you train dictionaries on different uh, categories, like different butterflies or different, uh, different CIFAR categories, um, did you try then, so you didn't show any, like, did you try to use those dictionaries somehow in a classification pipeline? And, and like, I've tried that and had 
I haven't had as much success as I th as I thought I would. I'm just curious if it's similar, I, yeah, similar. Okay. So yeah, we were actually very excited about that. Um, we've had you know okay success, but not not quite as exciting as you'd expect um, with a deep learning system. Something we were actually talking about earlier. One thing you can do is you can actually just load the butterflies in directly. You know, so if you just take these things and use actual images as your dictionary for a lot of classes of problems, that that actually works really well. And so then you're trying to sparse code a new example into the sort of the examples you have so far. And then you look at which examples actually got recruited in that reconstruction. And then if whoever, which category had the most, um, you can sort of assign the category. That works really well. We're still tweaking with, you know, sort of trying to classify with these. We're not, you know, that was the original motivation, trying to get the bird not to eat the poisonous butterfly. Um, so we're definitely still looking to that. A lot of open questions in that area. So when you train your dictionary, your uh, quality cost function is uh, least squares, in essence. And uh, we know that perceptually, we actually have a different quality cost functions. How do you reconcile those things? I'm sorry, say it one more time. I'm saying perceptually, we don't perceive least squares as uh, um, imperceptible distortion. So uh -huh. things that are uh, least squares, bad, or uh, for, for classifiers actually look, look good for us, and things that look good to classifiers look really distorted uh, to us. So looks like we, we biologically we and least square classifiers are different cost functions. And uh, yet you are saying that uh, this is how all the neural networks should work. How, and, and I'm asking, how do you reconcile those uh, things? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I'm not exactly sure how we can sort of, uh, you know. One thing that sort of makes me, th what makes me sort of uh, think of a, of, a, of a similar result, I'm not sure exactly if it's what you're saying, but um, there's been some work to take this and then feed that through a convol convolutional neural network to then try to fix that. Um, so I don't know if, I mean, that's sort of, making, your question's making me think of that. So I'm not exactly, um, so I think there's a lot of interesting things like that. Uh, I'm not sure about how we perceive L2 versus L1 in terms of perception. I'd have to think about that a little more. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>